I would like to start by expressing my gratitude in the beginning. I'm uh, very happy to be here. Thanks for having me, especially my thanks to the society. It's my first time in the UK and um, I've been speaking English for the last uh, three days, I guess. It's the longest time uh, for which I spoke English alone, though I texted my wife in Turkish. Uh, but if I make more mistakes than I did in Northern Ireland, as we were there, please excuse me, it's, it's, since it's my um, second language. So yeah, uh, Matthew mentioned, uh, my name is Samet Shahin. Uh, I come from Turkey, uh, Izmir, as I will show on the map in a second. Uh, I'm an elder at a local church uh, in Izmir, one of the three elders. We are a Reformed Presbyterian church uh, in Izmir, one of the four uh, Presbyterian congregations, I might, I might say, uh, across all around Turkey. Um, I'm also involved in a translation ministry. Uh, we try to find some good books, uh, translate them from English into Turkish, publish them, and distribute them as much as possible uh, all around Turkey. Um, I'm also a PhD student, a PhD candidate, they say. Uh, so um, I'm a PhD candidate in counseling, guidance and counseling uh, at a public university in Izmir. It has to do with career counseling or vocational uh, guidance. Uh, uh, Lord willing, uh, next year, this month, I might have, uh, uh, I will have graduated uh, from my PhD studies. I'm married, uh, I've been married for three years. Uh, we have a son, he just turned uh, five months old. Uh, he's a very cute uh, guy, uh, whom I miss, uh, actually. Um, so that's a quick uh, explanation, introduction of uh, myself. To talk about Turkey a little bit, uh, you can see the map, the world map, where Turkey uh, uh, resides. It's a large peninsula uh, bridging the continents of Europe and Asia, uh, actually. You can see Greece, Bulgaria, Europe there, and Georgia, Armenia, Syria, Iraq. Uh, you can see the, uh, all those countries there. Um, it used to be, it used to belong to the Ottoman Empire uh, uh, as the conquer of Constantinople happened uh, by the Ottomans in uh, 1453 and after the First World War, uh, Turkey became a republic uh, through the leading figure in Turkey uh, and his name was uh, Atatürk, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, some of you might have heard about him. Uh, Population-wise, Turkey has around uh, 85 million people. I would say 90% um, of them are uh, Muslims, though many of them are uh, nominal uh, Muslims. Uh, you know, as in some uh, Roman uh, Catholic ca countries, uh, people think ethnicity and religion, it's all uh, connected. So they call them as Muslims, even though, you know, without having read the Quran in their entire uh, lives. I also would like to mention that Simirna, Izmir, where I come from actually, is relatively more secular. So as, uh, as you go towards the western parts of Turkey, as we approach Greece, uh, you would see more um, you know, a secular atmosphere. But if you go towards the eastern parts of Turkey, you would see more conservative uh, Muslim uh, population there. And also from a biblical pers perspective, Turkey has a very, uh, uh, Turkey has some significance, a uh, big significance actually, uh, as, you, uh, as you're familiar with, seven churches of Revelation, all of them are in Turkey. You can see um, Philadelphia, uh, uh, Simirna, Pergamo, Pergamos on the, on the map. Also Bo, uh, the Apostle Paul's birthplace, uh, Tarsus Mersin, as we know from the book of Acts, uh, chapter nine, verse 19. Uh, you can see Mersin uh, right uh, over the Cyprus, each child, it reads Mersin. So Tarsus is there, Apostle Paul's um, birthplace. Uh, also, we know that Paul preached in Ephesus, which is only an hour drive uh, to where I live. Uh, you, would, you might uh, see all the ruins there. So that's, uh, it's again another significance from a biblical perspective. And also um, where the term Christian was coined. Uh, it's actually in Turkey, uh, Antioch. Uh, again, it's uh, on. Yeah, it's right to Mersin, uh, Apostle Paul's birthplace. It's the first time you know the term Christian uh, was coined, as we know from the Book of Acts, uh, chapter eleven, verse twenty-six. And um, Bible translation in Turkey uh, is an interesting topic. Uh, actually, I might say. 
so far there has only been two prevalent translations in the history of the uh, Turkish church. We had kitab Mukaddes, which comes from Persian, meaning a holy book. Uh, the old translation, we, we call it sometimes the old translation. Uh, it was the, the last edition of this translation was in 1941. And then we had, we had Kutsal Kitab. Uh, it's the modern Turkish version, meaning again, the holy book uh, in Turkish. First edition in 2001, and the second edition, the last edition, in 2008. Um, but first complete translation dates back to the seventh, uh, 17th century Ottoman era. So there have been some translation attempts, more than two translations. But these are the only complete uh, translations that were printed and distributed and uh, were read. So this, uh, you, might, you might see on the photo here, it's... Uh, it's a Polish guy named Wojciech Bobowski. I might have, uh, maybe I'm mispronouncing his name, but he was later known as Ali Ufki. His Turkish name was Ali Ufki. So the history says, some of the resources tell that he was taken captive in a war. Uh, he was of a uh, Polish background, a Protestant background, uh, actually. And then he was brought to Constantinople. So he was the guy who translated the first complete Turkish Bible translation, but also some resources say that, uh, tell that he was converted to Islam in a, in, um, in a season of his life. So we don't really know whether the translation was done while he was a Muslim or while he was still a uh, Christian. There are some competing um, uh, stories about him. So he worked as the translator for this project. He also worked uh, as a translator for different um, works uh, for the Ottoman uh, Empire. And as I said, he was the first uh, translator who completed the uh, Turkish translation. And um, again, as I said, uh, it was done in the 17th century, though the, uh, the complete edition, the last edition was in the, in the 20th century. But since he was in the 19th century, sorry, 17th century, his translation was based upon the Masoretic text and the received text. It was... You know, this is before Westcott and Hort and all the other uh, discoveries. And I would say Kitab Mukaddes, the, uh, the old translation is very literal. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's almost like the uh, Turkish uh, authorized version in terms of its um, translation philosophy. But at the same time, it's right now from a modern Turkish perspective, very old and very Islamic in virtual. So it's not only Allah. Uh, you know, that would make it sound like, uh, uh, make it sound more Islamic. There are other, ver there are other um, translational issues that, um, that you would think this was um, translated by a Muslim, uh, probably. So again, it's very literal, very old, and Islamic uh, in virtues. And the other one is Kutsal Kitab, uh, the modern Turkish translation. Um, I was told last week I was with another minister in Turkey who had some contact with the uh, uh, translation committee of the modern translation. And they told him that they translated it from the NIV itself uh, rather than basing the translation upon uh, the original uh, text. So I, I would say it's the modern translation is based upon the critical text, but not in the sense of the Greek text uh, when it comes to the New Testament but uh, the NIV itself. So it's neither old nor Islamic in word choice. Uh, a, an average Turkish person would easily understand, understand it, but again, it's uh, very dynamic in comparison with the old translation. And you will understand how dynamic or how literal it is when we come to the, some of the uh, examples I took uh, from the verses. And um, there's only one Turkish Bible Society in Turkey, and it owns the copyrights for both uh, translations. And I might add that they are um, ecumenical and institutional structure, and also uh, in sales. So you might find some Eastern Orthodox uh, uh, workers in their staff, some Catholics. Also, if you go onto their website, you might find books by Pope Francis. You might find some books by uh, the, the Patriarch Bartholomew, the Patriarch of the uh, East Orthodox Church, also some Jewish resources and some Protestant resources as well. And also, uh, if you recall, I mentioned that the old translation was based upon the Masoretic in Hebrew, 
Masoretic text in Hebrew, and the text is Receptus. But since the Bible society follows the modern critical um, uh, ideology, even though the old translation is in print right now, it's in print rearranged according to the critical text. So it's old, it's literal, but you might not see 1 John 5, 7, and 8, uh, for example. So right now we don't have any printed Bible that is based upon the Textus Receptus except the New Testament uh, printed by the uh, society, done by the late uh, Turkish translator. And all, uh, another quick fact is we have around 10,000 Protestants in Turkey right now, all around uh, Turkey, which is actually a generous number given the fact that some of them follow, a prosperity, follow the prosperity gospel or something similar to that. Some are ecumenical, some do not really you know, care about denominational or theological uh, differences. But, you know, they are Protestants in the sense that they are neither Catholic nor Eastern Orthodox. And it's a sad number considering, you know, all these maps, the significance of Turkey uh, in the Bible. But again, by God's grace, we have uh, 10,000 uh, Protestants in Turkey. And, not, and uh, the majority of them are Turkish uh, Christians who converted from uh, Islam to Christianity. So as we approach the issues of text and translation, I was thinking about how to present uh, some of the problems that we have in our modern translation. Uh, I forgot to mention that all uh, Protestants use the modern translation. So far I've got to only meet uh, one uh, old person who would use the old translation, but that was it. So all Turkish uh, uh, Christians, I might say, uh, they use the modern translation. And I would like to present some of the problems that this translation has by using four different categories. The first one is summary-like translations. The second one is inaccurate word choices. The third, biased interpretations, we might call them. And the fourth category is omissions. So what I mean by summary-like translations is translations where the gist is conveyed, but not every word in the original text is translated. So let's look at four of them. On the left, you will see the revised Trinitarian Bible Society uh, uh, translation uh, on which I'm working on right now, as I will mention later. And on the right, you will see the authorized uh, version. And then on the next slide, I will show you on the left the modern Turkish reading. And on the right, I will show you the literal translation from Turkish into English. So this is an example by uh, in the book of Judges, uh, chapter 17, verse 12. Uh, you... The authorized version reads, And uh, Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. So you can see on, in Turkish, the, we have a similar length. Uh, it's shorter because we have suffixes attached at the end of the word. Uh, but you would see ve, 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 three times we have ends. So it's, uh, you know, relatively, it's actually very, very similar to the authorized version because it f tries to follow the original text basically. And let's see how the modern version puts it. He took the young Levite into his house, ordaining him into priesthood. So, and Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest, and was in the house of Micah. This is how the authorized version puts it. And here we have, he took the young Levite into, into his house, ordaining him into priesthood. So you don't see any end uh, in it, and that's not the only uh, problem, of course. The other one is uh, from the book of Judges, 19.4. This is relatively um, more shocking. Uh, probably it will sound more shocking to you. So here the authorized version reads, And his father-in-law, the damsel's father, retained him. And the TBS, Turkish Bible, uh, says something very, very uh, similar. And let's look uh, how, the modern, how the modern translation puts it. Please be ready. He retained him. And that's it. No mention of his father-in-law, the damsel's father. It's just he retained him. Uh, the other example is from the book of Deuteronomy 23, 5. Here you would read the Lord thy God three times in the authorized version as it is in the original text. And we also have the TBS Turkish Bible, Tanrı Rab, Tanrı Rab, Tanrı Rab, the Lord thy God. But the modern Turkish translation omits the Lord, 
the Lord thy God in the middle. So we only have two. You know, this doesn't make sense to me because if you are just, you know, trying to be practical, why not go with one, uh, you know, but the Lord your God and then just use he. But here we have two times the Lord thy God rather than three times. So the, the last example from the, uh, from the New Testament is 1 Corinthians uh, 6, 11. Uh, here, you know, Paul talks about how the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says, you, are, you don't have that identity, you are new. Uh, and the authorized version reads, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and, and by the Spirit of our God. So we have the conjunction, conjunction but three times, whereas the modern translation reads, but you were washed, you, are sanctif you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, there is only one conjunction in the beginning. So the other category is inaccurate word choices. Here I'm in translations where while there is an accurately corresponding word in Turkish, a faulty Turkish word, was preferred. So let's look at one example. In 1 Samuel, in 1 Samuel 10, 9, uh, the authorized version reads, and it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And you can see, uh, sorry, you can see uh, yurek is the corresponding word for heart, which is very modern, which, which is something that every Turkish person would understand. And the modern translation reads, God gave him a new personality. Uh, I mean, I would say it's, you know, uh, if you're talking about, you know, our will, our intellect, our emotions, our personality involves all those aspects. But, you know, we have a biblical anthropology that is represented in the Bible, which has a lot to do with the heart. And as I said, we have that word in Turkish, whereas the modern translation does not uh, put it in, in the translation. A relatively um, uh, shocking one, again, from Matthew 5, 48. It reads, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven perfect. And we, uh, the Turkish, TBS Turkish Bible reads, Kusursuz, kusur meaning flaw, suz meaning without, so without flaw, perfect. But the modern Turkish translation reads, Be competent, uh, even as your Father who is in heaven incompetent. I mean, if you... The word for that in Turkish is yetkin. If you look up the dictionary and type yetkin, you would see that, you know, perfect and flawless is at the maybe third or fourth uh, level, uh, fourth description. I mean, you might justify that, but the first uh, description might be competence, as in business competence, you know, being, you know, gifted or crafty uh, in something. So why not use um, uh, yetkin, competent, rather than Perfect. We have words for that. The other one is from Mark 1.15. The kingdom of God is at, it is at hand. The TBS Turkish Bible reads, The kingdom of God drew near. And the modern translation reads, The sovereignty of God is at hand. Um, you know, the, the Turkish uh, word reads, Egemenlik, uh, which is not a word as you, you would hear frequently as you hear sovereignty in, you know, uh, more Christian circles, but uh, you know it. It doesn't mean kingdom. It means the the power that the king has, but not the kingdom uh, itself. So I think they wanted to you know maybe modernize, or you know they they thought the kingdom theme sounds very political. I'm not sure uh, about the uh, idea behind that. But here it reads: um, the sovereignty of God is at hand. The other example is from uh, is Luke 3.2. The word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Uh, here the TBS Turkish Bible reads, Yohanna, which is, I, I think, uh, something uh, that was talked about uh, in uh, Persian uh, translations as well. So the late translator changed Yahya in Turkish into Yohanna, thinking that Yahya actually comes from the Quran itself because the Quran repeats the story uh, about uh, John the Baptist. We have Yohanna for the Apostle John in Turkish, whereas the modern translation uses the word derived from the Quran to describe uh, John the Baptist. 
And I think this might create some problems given the fact that Yahya has some Islamic uh, connotations that is loaded, uh, that it has. So the, word, the noun itself, the name itself is loaded with some Islamic connotations, but the TBS the translator puts it as Yohanna, which is the same for the Apostle John. The other category is biased interpretations. And here I use the word biased, uh, but I, would, I myself would not like to be biased towards the translation committee or the modern translation. I mean, um, I would like to give the benefit of the doubt as a Christian to show charity, as Dr. Jeff Riddle uh, mentioned, and we are thankful for the work. As I mentioned, probably no Turk has ever, uh, uh, was ever converted by reading a translation that was based upon the Textus Receptus or that was based upon a literal text. Maybe in the past there might be some, but you know, given the evangelical activities in the last seven decades, we didn't have a literal translation that was based upon the uh, Textus Receptus. So I'm you know, thankful that God used this translation to bring myself uh, into Christ. But uh, here I mention translations where the Turkish rendition is not justifiable, nor linguistically, nor semantically, given the impression that there was a biased interpretation rather than translation. And you will understand what I'm saying as we look at the examples. So one is from Genesis 50:20. Here the authorized version reads, you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. Here we have the same Hebrew word repeated twice, though the authorized version uses two different verbs, but it's basically the same in meaning. Uh, and the TBS Turkish Bible uses the same verb. But here in the modern translation we have God turned that evil into good. So God turns that evil into good rather than meaning it from the uh, beginning. I mean, if you recall Deuteronomy 23.5, there, there, um, it was talking about God turning the, bless, turning the curse into a blessing, which is justifiable uh, based upon the original, original uh, text. But here it's not justifiable. And it gives the impression that God intervenes later on rather than you know, planning everything from the beginning for the good uh, of many. The other example is from uh, the book of Judges 9.23. Here it reads, um, Then God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the man of Shechem. And in Turkish it reads, Kötübü ruh gönderdi, meaning sent an evil spirit. But the modern translation reads, Then God set Abimelech and the people of Shechem against each other. So again, God does not use here the evil, an evil spirit for the benefit of uh, many, for the good of many, but you know this reads something uh, completely different. And again, if we can uh, sense that, many, many of the verses in this category, they will have to do uh, with the sovereignty uh, of God. The other example is Nehemiah 6, uh, 16. The, the authorized version reads, for they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. Let's see how the modern translation puts it. We did this work with the help of our God. So there is no we in the original text. There is no help in the original text. It's God doing something. But the modern translation reads, we did this work with the help of our God. I mean, why do we change that? We have many modern words in Turkish to indicate that, but this is how it looks. Uh, one, uh, one another example, one final example in this third category as we approach our uh, final category. It's Amos 3.6. Here the authorized version reads, Shall there be evil in a city, and the Lord hath not done it. The, the TBS Turkish Bible reads, uh, Calamity rather than evil, but it literally says, And the Lord hath not done it. And the modern translation reads, would disaster befall a city without the Lord's approval? Again, we don't have the, wor we don't have the word approval uh, here. I mean, if we are talking about the book of Job, we might say, you know, there is an approval going on there in the beginning uh, of the book of Job. But we don't have any approval here. It's basically, and the Lord hath not done it. So the same case, again, uh, 
having something uh, uh, to do with the sovereignty of uh, God. And the last category I would like to mention is omissions. And here I, may, I mean translations where classical phrases or verses of the Protestant Bible are omitted. You're probably familiar with, um, you will probably be familiar with uh, all of them. But here one is Matthew 5, 22. Whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. The modern translation reads, whosoever is angry with his brother will be judged. Uh, indicating that there is no righteous anger or whenever you're angry, you're condemned. There's nothing to do about it. And this is a critical text reading, basically. Uh, the other example is Colossians 1.14. You know, um, blood is a very important theme that is de-emphasized in modern critical uh, readings. Here, the authorized version reads, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And the Turkish reading is, in him we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So you will not find blood here, which is inherent in the gospel of our Lord, as we know it. And, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, if we do not have blood in this verse, we lose the theme of blood completely. I mean, we have many verses uh, for that. But, you know, the, as, um, as um, Jonathan mentioned, we have this cumulative doctrine that we, uh, for which we need all these verses to emphasize. If the Bible emphasizes it, we, sh we should emphasize it. And here it's not emphasized. Another example, a famous one, 1 John 5, 7 and 8. It used to be in the old translation back in the 17th century, but you wouldn't find it even in the um, old translation, the last edition in 14, uh, sorry, um, 1941. Here you would see the three heavenly witnesses, as the AV puts it, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And you wouldn't see that in the modern Turkish translation. That's why we, we, won't have, uh, we wouldn't have verse 7 and verse 8 separately, so it's connected, because otherwise you would have to jump the verse, and it would look odd, it would cause some problems. So here... Uh, you will not find three heavenly witnesses. The other example, the last example, is from the book of John 4, 43, 41. This is different than the rest, because here even the critical text reading is not followed. Uh, because, I believe, since it's translated from the NIV, you, you would see that NIV departs from the criti critical text reading here, uh, actually. So in the authorized version it reads, Now after two days he departed thence and went into Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath no honor in his own country. You, would see, you see for the conjunction there. And here you don't see it. For or because is not there. And I think it's important because it tells something, you know. It's more important than end. It's for or because. But here it's... Maybe because it's hard to explain why our Lord would do that, <laughs> it's just omitted and it just follows with the um, Jesus himself testified and that's it. So even the critical text is not followed here. And as I'm coming to my conclusion, I would like to talk about some of the particular problems to Turkey. And then I would like to talk about how our cor correspondence started and how the, the current progress of the project. So um, some problems particular to Turkey would be people mostly rely on their Turkish translation alone, you know. We don't uh, speak English very well in our country, you know, we learn it but we are not able to do, we are not able to do some research in English. So we need to, you know, we don't have many books, that's what, that's what we are doing in our translation ministry. We're trying to translate from English to Turkey so that people ha would have some theological books in their language. So this is, another, this is another reason why a, an accurate Turkish translation of scripture is necessary in Turkey. It's necessary everywhere, but in our context, I would say there are some other reasons that makes it urgent, more uh, urgent. Also, only a few pastors are competent in biblical languages. And also, as I said, not all are competent in English to access reliable resources, as Turkish resources are scarce. 
Also, character names from the Quran sometimes reinforce the Islamic notion of the Bible. So sometimes Muslims say, we believe uh, in Yahya. Uh, why, do you not, uh, you know, why do you not believe in Muhammad? Or we believe in uh, Jesus. Why do you not believe in uh, Muhammad? So I would say um, what the late Turkish translator did might be helpful in our context. But uh, yeah, we might debate about it as well. And also Trinity is under attack by many Muslims. Muslims should profess belief in the books that, was, that were inspired by the Bible. They need to confess belief in the Torah. They need to confess belief in the Injil, the New Testament. But if they do so, they cannot get past the Alpha and Omega. They cannot jump to Muhammad and confess belief in Muhammad as well. And that what they do is they say the Bible has been corrupted or the Trinitarian verses should be interpreted metaphorically rather than uh, literally, rather than a, not a Trinitarian interpretation, but a Unitarian interpretation. But if we had 1 John 5, 7 and 8 as a perfect proof text for the Trinity, I think they would lose the debate. I think they, they, they already lose it because we have the only begotten Son and, and everything. But this is the perfect proof text that we see in the Westminster Catechism and, yeah, in catechisms. So if we had the first John 5, 7, and 8, uh, we would have the perfect proof text, which, was, uh, which would undermine their attacks uh, to the Trinity. And how our correspondence with the society started? I, well, um, we started a publishing ministry called Karanlık Tanışa in English, From Darkness to Light Publishing. But, you know, it sounds better in Turkish because we have two words uh, for From Darkness to Light. So uh, it's better in Turkish. So we started this in 2019 with the help of an American brother who, uh, who unfortunately passed away right after our contact. He was, in, he was serving in Turkey. He was diagnosed with cancer. So we spent some time together, but that was it. But he helped us a lot to launch this ministry. And it was, it was this brother who mentioned the TBS Turkish translation right before the COVID-19 started. And it was the first time for me to hear about that, to hear that there will be this new translation coming soon. So I got that in mind, but uh, you know, then uh, I forgot about it. And then a few years later, I was expecting this translation. I was sitting and thinking about what's up with that translation. So I, I uh, went on the website of the TBS and I couldn't see any uh, Turkish uh, Bible uh, translation. And then I sent an email uh, to ask about the progress. And then that's how we ended up uh, making a Zoom call with Matthew and Jonathan, uh, I believe. And then I took over the revision work of the translation. Uh, I heard about the late Turkish translator uh, and, you know, uh, that, that the need for, for a revision, especially when it comes to the uh, Old Testament. But it helped me a lot, you know, I was not of... TR persuasion, uh, but the, the, the books that we translate helped me to see that we need a faithful, literal translation because most of the authors that we translate, they are from either Reformed Baptists or Reformed Presbyterians, uh, or some wouldn't call them Reformed, but at least they are, you know, Calvinistic who try to follow some literal translations. And as I was trying to translate their arguments, the paragraphs, I would cite our modern translation, which, would, which wouldn't make sense, you know, in, in the case of those arguments. Like Genesis 50, 20, uh, I was translating a, a book on uh, how, how God is providentially uh, guiding the COVID-19, and the author would cite Genesis 50, 20, and our translation would say, the, the author would say, it doesn't read, he turned evil into good. It reads, he meant evil for good. And I would cite our modern translation, he turned evil into good. But the author, I would have to translate the author's words. It, didn't, it doesn't say that, but I was not able to do that. So our translation ministry helped me a lot to see the need for a faithful and literal translation. And the TR position then followed uh, naturally, uh, actually. So it helped me a lot. And then it was at that time I contacted the society and yeah. Then I took over the revision work of the translation. And the current progress, uh, if I might add, is I'm revising the, uh, the book of 2 Samuel. 
I thought I would finish the project within a year, but it's not possible. Uh, I miscalculated it. It would probably take uh, two years, uh, uh, I would say. So what I'm doing is uh, spelling, punctuation, sentence structure, word choice, I'm mainly focusing on them. Uh, also, italics is another um, important uh, issue. The Turkish translators sometimes uh, 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 forget, uh, forgot the italics. So I'm trying to revise italics as well. And also in Turkish, uh, one quick fact is we don't have he, she, it uh, in our language. So the, the Turkish translator made a very good work in translating everything literally. But if we translate he as o in uh, Persian as well, I believe, we, we don't understand what's going on if there's a male and there's a female. So if it's Isaac and Rebecca, it only reads maybe the corresponding would be it in uh, uh, English. I'm not sure. Uh, we have uh, all for animate and inan inanimate objects. So it was, uh, and on these cases, I have to use uh, like Jacob in italics, Rebecca in italics, sometimes David in italics. It depends. So this is another uh, uh, point that I'm working on, uh, actually. My plan is to finish uh, 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 the, the project by the end of 2000. 24 or the beginning of 2025 and actually predicting how it will be received is very very difficult in Turkey we are used to a very modern dynamic translation people I assume that the majority of the uh, Turkish congregations will think we don't have three ends in a sentence uh, we only have one and then commas so I'm not sure whether they will like it uh, I think the new translation is very modern, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with uh, uh, when it comes to word choices, but I would say um, it will be different uh, compared <laughs> to our uh, modern translation, so it's hard to predict how well it will be received. We don't have any TR, Masoretic debates in Turkey, people probably have no idea, most of them. Some uh, pastors, some ministers, uh, they know about these conversations, but I would say our church might be the only church uh, who would, you know, f follow the TR position. Uh, I and the two elders of mine, they didn't really, they have not w gone deep uh, in, you know, digging deep in, you know, the arguments from the TR position, but they seem to agree uh, with me uh, a lot. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if people will not... Uh, people would dislike it in the beginning, some of the ministers who follow the critical text tradition. So I'm, I'm giving all these facts to ask your prayers, to ask for your prayers, actually. So if you could pray uh, for the project, for strength, for guidance, for wisdom, uh, for myself. Also, you know, for the Turkish people that they would receive the received uh, text uh, in the, in the uh, following years in which, uh, by God's grace, we uh, come to an end in this uh, project. So prayers are um, very welcome uh, and I would like to thank you all for listening and